So, how many people uh, caught the reference for the song? Losing my religion? It's not about religion, it's not about spirituality, it's about uh, loss of faith, uh, loss of confidence. Uh, and uh, you might not know it seeing me now, but the prospect of being in front of a thousand people um, talking would have um, given me flop sweat um, as little as 20 years ago. When I was in fourth grade, um, uh, I had a horrendous experience and uh, it put glitches in my software. Um, so I went through a whole series of, uh, of you know, growth experiences, working on myself, uh, learning, becoming knowledgeable about uh, uh, chemistry and biochemistry and aging, neurodegenerative diseases. And then um, approaching 1990, a friend of mine, John Morgenthaler, who was uh, one of the uh, uh, starting instigators for the whole smart drug uh, revolution. This is at a time when uh, the Reagan campaign, Just Say No, was in full swing, and the concept of smart drugs came onto the scene, and of course it was pretty um, controversial. And uh, so it, it, he said, I'm gonna put you on, on television. I went, oh shit. <laughs> so I went ahead and I did workshops. I, I, I joined the Summit organization, I took their video workshop five times. Two times as a paid uh, participant, five, uh, three times, uh, you know, assisting the workshop, watching the whole process happen, and that helped me reprogram my subconscious mind and my um, response to that concept of getting up in front of people and risking making a fool of myself and being laughed at and all those kinds of scary things that the brain uh, talks about when you're uh, when you don't really know what's going on, but your subconscious mind is telling you so. Um, I don't know, if, if for those people who were here yesterday, um, and the, I guess for those people who are here just now for the first time, uh, yesterday Dan and Phil talked about safety. Remember that? Yeah. S-A-F-E-T-Y, security, autonomy, fairness, esteem, trust. Well, they were talking about danger and the, the subconscious mind and how it connects to issues of danger, where in a split second you make that decision about danger. And it's not rational. It takes place before you can even think about what it is that you might be considering in that, in that uh, situation. And so for me, it, it really isn't, you know, my, my fear of public speaking wasn't about danger, it was about my perception of danger. And the nice thing about perception is it's, it's mental. It's in the realm of the mind and not the brain or the body. And because of that, I could change it, and you could change it. Um, so on some level, that, that um, puts that arena, that issue of stage fright, into my court. It's my ball, it's, you know, I can do what I want with it. And you know, there's, there's all kinds of ways that people have tricks. Um, uh, John Gray was talking about um, you know, sex, last night, and one of the tricks for public speaking is to imagine the audience naked. And this is supposed to be like, you've got clothes on and they're all naked, and therefore you're, you're not at the same disadvantage they are, and um, that never worked for me. <laughs> <laughs> um, but one thing that does, and that is to confess, to tell the truth. You say, if you're nervous, you say, I'm nervous. And that takes the pressure off it because you've just, you know, in a sense, brought the audience onto your side because if they were up here, they'd be nervous too, right? <laughs> um, so I realized that, you know, it doesn't really matter what I think about the circumstance, that, you know, the reality of it is you want to hear me talk about things. You want to hear me give you some wisdom about um, this aspect of metabolism or some practical hints about how to take vitamins and this kind of thing. And so, you know, what I realized is, is that in these kinds of situations, you know, you're rooting for me as much as I would be um, afraid of a negative reaction. Um, 
So you want to hear me talk, and I'll just you know, caution you that at some point during the talk, your head may explode, but don't worry about it. When you wake up tomorrow, it'll be back. Um, when I was uh, covering the, the uh, submitting my presentation to Mark, he said, too much text. Um, so um, I'll just warn you in advance, there's a lot of information in this. Um, I'll, I'll go through it very well, but if something flies by on the screen and I don't address it, and there'll be a lot of those kinds of things, come to the workshop afterwards in, in Ballroom C and raise it as a question. I'll be glad to deal with it at that time. So, so in 1990, I started working on this. In 1992, I dipped my toe in the water, San Francisco local talk show. And then I did, in 1993, Larry King Live in front of two million people. And I was on a half a dose of beta blocker and half a dozen smart drugs at the same time. So um, from then on, it was, it was you know, onwards and upwards because that was, in a sense, a challenge event and uh, drug-assisted. Um, I did breathing exercises, um, uh, EFT techniques for activating um, parasympathetic pressure points. I was using a whole bunch of uh, crutches to deal with that circumstance, but because that was the, the, the peak experience, I could say, okay, now I'm done and now I can relax. And so now I actually enjoy audiences. I make contact with people. I see how they react to things. And so it's, it's much more fun this way. Uh-oh. Uh, this is a really great book, Polyvagal Theory. This talks about how the autonomic nervous system in humans is different from other forms of life and how um, it all comes down to um, perception of safety in social environments and how that fight or flight in us is more regulated by the loss of vagal tone, which would keep our sympathetic stress urges under control. And this book is highly technical, written by an academic, but there's a couple of moments of clarity, and I'd like to start with those. Perceptions and assumed threats to survival uh, may promote massive withdrawal of the parasympathetic tone and a reciprocal excitation of sympathetic tone. In other words, panic, fear, anxiety. So if you think that a situation is dangerous, your body reacts as if it is. And on the other side, which is, I thought this was very fun. Normally we're taught that the body is symmetrical, but we know about right brain and left brain people. Well, here he says, the functional dominance of the right side of the brain in regulating autonomic function has implications for specialization of motor and language dominance on the left side. Um, of the brain. So now we know that, um, you know, part of the problem with Mars and Venus is that women are talking to the wrong side of the brain. And that, I guess, in men, we know that the half of the brain is located elsewhere. <laughs> okay, so in, uh, in the 90s, I was publishing Smart Drug News. And, um, and apparently Dave was, you know, reading everything avidly. And um, I came up with this idea of, of the designer brain because at that point I was hacking my own um, emotions, my motivations. I was looking at how neurotransmitters altered the way I worked, the way I perceived things, the way I relaxed or didn't relax in some situations, uh, issues of drive, issues of peacefulness, of um, meditation. And so I came up with this idea that, you know, you could modify yourself, you could modify your brain to fit what it was that you liked and to de-emphasize things that were more automatic that you might not like. So what do you want to be? That was what I, how I looked at it. 
And you know, there's all kinds of ways in which you can pick what it is that you want to look at. So, of course, because I was doing a, I was a scientist and doing analysis, I was very much interested in thinking side of things. Um, because I had a big workload, I was putting out a newsletter and you know, trying to put it out every month. Um, according, motivational was an issue. Um, memory was always an issue. In certain ways I could remember things, other things I couldn't remember very well, so I was very much interested in that. Um, uh, creativity. Um, I wasn't at that point doing art, but I've now resumed it, so I'm now painting again. But I had done art in junior high school and high school, and I sublimated all of that into doing illustrations for the newsletter. So I was taking scientific ideas and creating illustrations to emphasize the essences of what those were. But um, other people might be interested in income, job promotion, career. Um, so uh, that could be an aspect for you. Um, uh, what I'd also noticed in, in myself is that those kinds of things that I would react most to other people were those things in myself that I didn't like. That uh, my automaticities would get in the way of my relationships to people. So I was very interested in where that came from, my reactivity. And of course, my stage fright was obvious and a very blatant obvious example of that. So I was always talking to therapists, how can you deal with this kind of thing? And in, in dealing with my stage fright, I was introduced to EFT therapy. Since then, I've learned all kinds of different things that I can share about in the other meeting. And one of them that the most, is most interesting to me is therapeutic shaking. This turns out to be a very effective way of unloading sympathetic stress in a way that doesn't require you to pay attention. So once you learn how to do it, you can do your email while you're therapeutically shaking, you can do talk on the phone with somebody, you can prepare a PowerPoint presentation. Um, people have traumas like my stage fright, but maybe somebody's sexually molested. It could go on and on. Uh, and then there's the top end of it, your goals, your visions, your aspirations in life. All of this can be a filter for how you deal with uh, what kind of designer brain you'd like to have. Um, let me do a little bit of stuff in stage fright because this is an example that, you know, well, changed my life. Um, it's all about autonomic dysregulation. And so Porges talks about that in the polyvagal theory, but from, from the perspective of what I would go through, basically perception of danger and then a um, activation of the sympathetic systems, a shutdown in my, um, my uh, uh, blood flow to the brain. So how many people here know about nitric oxide as a vasodilator? Okay, quite a few. How many people also know that carbon dioxide is also a vasodilator? Okay, not, not as many. Well, it turns out that carbon dioxide regulates the flow to the prefrontal cor cortex. So that part of your brain that plans, that anticipates, that strategizes, is dependent upon carbon dioxide. Well, what happens when you get fearful? What happens if you have a panic attack? You start breathing shallow and rapid. You blow off huge amounts of CO2. Your CO2 crashes. Blood flow to your brain shuts down and then you're just limbic. You just react emotionally. You react based on your previous patterns and you can't plan anything. That breathing exercise we did earlier is a way to um, drive, to raise your CO2, by the way, where you breathe in slowly, diaphragmatically, you hold your breath, that creates pressure, which drives the CO2 back into your lungs. And then if you exhale through pursed lips, or through your vocal cords, so you're exhaling under pressure, that also drives the CO2 back into your blood. I'm looking down because this is where I see what I'm doing. My PowerPoint presentation is to remind my memory what it is I'm supposed to talk about next. So this is a slide that's supposed to, this is an example of one of those uh, too much text. <laughs> but I'm gonna pause it here. So. One of the reasons that I had um, panic attack is because I had hypometabolism, low metabolic rate. Hypothyroidism is the most common um, cause of it. And because of that, I was a night owl and I had low CO2 levels so that if I started breathing abnormally, sympathetically, my CO2 would crash more easily than it would be in an average person. So part of my hack was to raise my metabolic, my metabolic rate. 
Um, since then, I've learned about selenium and iodine relating to that, but at that time, I didn't know about it. Um, I also, later in life, had a coagulopathy event. This is a thick blood syndrome caused for me, in me by two simultaneous fungal infections, one of which was ordinary toenail fungus that a huge percent of the population suffers from. Even though these infections weren't systemic, they were irritating my immune system to the extent that my blood became too viscous to irritate my brain properly. So even though my intellect wasn't affected, I could read a scientific paper and understand the development of the ideas and get to the end and go, yeah. But at that point, I couldn't remember how the paragraph started. So um, yeah, actually, Richard Cunyon helped me with that. He's a physician in San Francisco who designed the Ololoa formula at the end of the hall. Um, so th these are all factors that are um, uh, potentially um, aggravating to the issue of stage fright or panic disorder or social anxiety disorder. If any of these strike a bell with you, bring them up in the, in the other room. So I find it very useful to think about um, mental issues from the perspective of body, brain, and mind dynamic. Even though there, technically there really is, aren't lines that you can draw between these that are rigid, uh, it's, um, I find it very useful to um, consider how, um, as examples, how body-related kinds of conditions can produce frank mental symptoms. So um, vitamin B3 deficiencies. How many people have heard the phrase redneck syndrome? <laughs> okay, that's typically a vitamin three, B3 deficiency caused by eating corn as a primary staple. Uh, corn doesn't have much uh, tryptophan and niacin in it, and if you rely upon that as a dietary staple, you become vitamin B3 deficient, and that can lead to emotional volatility and um, depression, feelings of inadequacy, and so um, uh, that would lead to um, bigotry and racism and other kinds of uh, you know, mental manifestations of that. Um, B12 deficiency can cause um, a, a, a Wernicke-Korsakoff syndrome. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is triggered by a loss of glutathione recycling and its ability to detoxify mercury. Um, uh, the uh, vitamin B deficiencies in children cause a, um, behavioral, um, uh, behavioral problems in juvenile inmates in correctional facilities. This has actually been measured with brain scans and um, in average school kids in both England uh, and in California, they measured a 3.4 IQ point difference between kids not on supplements and kids taking a minimal vitamin supplement. When they broke it down, it was one third of the kids had a 10 point IQ increase simply by taking vitamins. That's a rapidly developing brain that would show that kind of uh, transformation. Um, autism onset is by a similar mechanism as, uh, um, as Alzheimer's disease. Uh, oxidative stress from a vaccine um, or the vaccine adjuvant um, produces an overwhelm of the system and the antigen presentation mechanisms break down and this, the gut-brain connection uh, encumbers the brain. I can feel my voice getting weak. So bear with me for a second. So in 1997, I, I, as one of the newsletters, I published this article on the designer brain content, and I listed these kinds of topics as things that people might want to hack. At that time, of course, the idea of biohacking um, didn't exist, but um, this is, in effect, what it was. And uh, that, um, that was a two-part article, and I focused, even though I talked about other neurotransmitters, I focused on dopamine and serotonin because of their core role in some personal issues that I was dealing with at the time. And um, so I, I laid out the metabolic pathway for, for serotonin and, you know, trip made from tryptophan, dependent upon B6, this kind of stuff, and why it was important. So when I took tryptophan or 5-hydroxytryptophan, how did it change the way I felt? How did it change the way I thought? How did it change the way I behaved? How did it change the way I slept? And so I tracked all that kind of stuff. 
And then I also did the same thing for dopamine, only this time it was uh, taking bean powder, um, fava beans, for example, are high in L-DOPA. Uh, or taking pharmaceutical um, L-DOPA. I also t tried uh, Depronil, um, European smart drug at the time, and um, experimented with that. And so I learned how dopamine is involved in self-expression and sexuality and um, uh, assertiveness. And all of that was very important for me from a functional point of view to get a lot of work done and to not only write a newsletter but build things and, and create art graphics and all the other things I was doing at the time. And that's, it's also interesting that that was correlated with longevity in animal studies. And that was part of my focus on aging. I was interested in looking at that. So this is the graph I created. I published it in the newsletter. But I was still thinking x, y at that point and not how it would be used. And so this is what I came up with afterwards. And uh, so I colorized it. And this is a, this is a way of, um, of mapping my brain and theoretically anybody's brain um, from the perspective of their dopamine and serotonin. And these are complementary neurotransmitters that are involved in basic motivational functions that affect the quality of our lives. The zest for life you get from dopamine. Passion comes from dopamine. So can obsession and compulsion. So it's not necessarily all good. Um, and uh, serotonin gives us peacefulness. It gives us love. It gives us good quality sleep, emotional stability, happiness. Uh, you can buy happiness. So I found this was a very easy way to orient it by turning it on its tip because it gave me a dopamine dominance to the, to the left and a serotonin dominance to the right. And um, that made a lot of sense in terms of making it easy to understand. And, Yellow being a color of excitement and blue being a color of tranquility made sense to me as well. And, and balance being straight down the center. So you can have low tone and be balanced, you can have medium tone and be balanced, and you can have high tone and be balanced. And that still changes the experience. It did for me. So the core um, issues of, um, let me, back up one here. The core issues were things that I experienced. So they were real to me personally. They were easy to move neurotransmitters slightly. Um, I didn't go out to extremes of, of psychosis for dopamine dominance. I didn't think it was necessary for me to experience that in order to map it. So. I just put it out there based on scientific studies and the fact that the drugs that are used to treat psychosis are neuroleptics that are um, to put dopamine under control. So I just mapped this whole thing out in a variety of ways that made sense to me and might make sense to you, especially if you can see an aspect uh, on this chart that is of personal relevance to you that you either like and don't have or have and don't like. Um, inflammation um, produces a, sh a shift in the serotonin axis on this graph and drives people in this, in this kind of direction. And so if somebody is a, um, is a high functioning person, it'll drive them into dopamine dominance. And that would be um, shopping therapy. Uh, gambling, um, uh, excessive cleaning, um, the, you know, obsession and compulsion. And interestingly enough, that happens naturally in Tourette syndrome. And we had a, um, one of my subscribers was um, a, a woman with Tourette's who was um, a translator for the UN. So. One of the problems about Tourette's is this involuntary vocalizations, and being a translator, this is, this is a, a big problem. And she had figured this out, that taking tryptophan kept her 
Tourette's under control so she could be an effective translator. And at the time, the FDA was looking to strip tryptophan off the marketplace, and she was in a panic. It was disappearing out of health food stores, and, and she couldn't get it, and so she was calling me up going, what do I do, what do I do, what do I do? But luckily, um, tryptophan remained available. I directed her to, for a brief period of time, after the tryptophan scare, uh, you could get human pharmaceutical tryptophan from a veterinary supplier who was you know, who really was delivering pharmaceutical tryptophan, and so I directed her to that person, and so she was happy. But that was an important demonstration to me that a constitutional or genetic predisposition to dopamine dominance could be overcome by overdriving serotonin to compensate. So that was a perfect example of a designer brain, only it was a Tourette's brain, and was to change it. Uh, this is an influence of basal metabolic rate. Excuse me. The, we use our metabolic rate to make things. And so when we have low metabolism, we ration our energy. And that could be lowered protein synthesis, slower healing rate, uh, lack of physical strength and stamina, but it can also be lowered level production of neurotransmitters. And so um, that moves people in an up and down direction for the, for the, uh, for the metabolic issue. And it's not just about um, metabolism because protein synthesis not, is not just energy dependent, it's also zinc dependent. And so if somebody has a zinc deficiency versus somebody who doesn't have a zinc deficiency, their relationship to neurotransmitter synthesis will be different. Um, superoxide um, is a catalyst is, is one of the cofactors for making serotonin. So if you live in a building that has metal air conditioning, or you live in a desert, or you live in Los Angeles, when the Santa Ana wind is blowing and you get de depleted of negative ions, your serotonin crashes and you become dopamine dominant, which means acts of violence, um, uh, people um, flipping each other off on the freeways, and um, other kinds of uh, interpersonal conflict. <laughs> um, thinking about the, 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 the designer brain from the perspective of the brain-mind dynamic is very useful for me. Um, and it's very useful for dealing with issues where your brain may not be what, doing as well as it was five years ago, ten years ago. At some point in your memory, you remember things were better. And it could be that there's something going wrong with your body and that's affecting your brain, and which is affecting your mind. Um, but um, there's, a lot, um, there's a lot of other kinds of levels to consider strategically. Um, uh, I mentioned, me mentioned a, a basal metabolic rate as a factor influencing that. And there's two basic elements to that in the human body. Um, ATP production, which is what powers all the enzymes in our body and controls the, the rate of metabolism and the, and the direction of metabolism, how well your liver detoxifies um, and responds to toxins in your food, for example. And then NADH, which is your primary reducing agent. Um, that is used to make ATP, and it's also used to recycle your, glu your glutathione, recycle your vitamin C to keep your body safe from free radicals. Neurotransmitters is a straightforward one. We've been talking about that, or I've been talking about it. And serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine are examples of ones that involve um, uh, attentiveness and relaxation. Um, acetylcholine is an obvious one. I'm taking a mild cholinergic right now to help, help me talk. Um, GABA is for uh, relaxation, both uh, central relaxation and peripheral relaxation in terms of lowering your muscle tension. It can be very useful after a hard day at work. Uh, GHB, which is now illegal, was one of the most powerful um, GABAergic kinds of compounds available and was a really marvelous drug for helping people in their per uh, personal productivity. It's now not available at all, other than as a prescription drug for like um, $40 a night. Uh, here's a few more neurotransmitters. Uh, nitric oxide, people have heard about a lot. Uh, carbon monoxide, how many people know that carbon monoxide is a s signaling factor? 
Yeah, it's pretty strange, huh? And then hydrogen sulfide is the most recent one. It's a pretty toxic substance, but in the low enough dose, it serves as a signaling factor. Then there's uh, uh, anandamide, uh, purines, and peptides as other kinds of signaling factors that are involved in communication. Theoretically, you could hack any of these if you find it relevant to you. So if you respond positively to marijuana extracts, you might want to consider the anandamide mechanism as a uh, issue for how your brain is working. Or if you have fibromyalgia and an abnormally high sensitivity to pain, you might consider that mechanism as well. Okay, smart drugs. It's a favorite subject of mine, but um, the things that get um, emphasized are the exotics. This is a perfect example of the exotics being ignored. One of the most effective smart drugs on the planet, um, most effective and most uh, inexpensive, is B-complex vitamins. Yet they don't get any respect at all. Um, I've done DOPA and Depranil. I do Depranil on a regular basis. I'm a dopamine, dopamine dominant and cholinergically dominant person. This is what I discovered in trying these things. Um, it, a small amount of choline can set me off and give me a tension-related headache. I naturally have high body armoring, uh, intenseness in the shoulders. And so that by, by experimenting with these things, I learned that about myself. And so now I don't make the mistake of doing too much cholinergic stimulation. And I'm more focused on the GABA side of things, especially at the end of the day when I want to wind down and go to sleep. Um, I don't have serotonergics in here, but adrenergics, uh, this is one of, uh, of, uh, uh, of our favorites for, uh, for Dave. And, uh, uh, he very much likes modafinil, and uh, I had an attraction for phenylalanine, although I didn't use it very often because I would, it would be often too stimulating for me. But if I wanted to uh, work all day uh, to midnight and then crash for four hours and then wake up and work another 14-hour you know, day, I, when it, I would take phenylalanine before I went to sleep at night, and it would kick in and produce an adrenergic effect so that but by the time I got into my second sleep cycle, I'd be starting to wake up. I'd only get three hours of good sleep, but at least I'd be up and functioning without the need for an alarm clock. So that's another example of biohacking, of brain hacking. Um, nootropics, um, phenoprastam and the racetams and the ampokines that are in development are, are much more exotic. Um, I very much like paracetam. It's one of my two favorite smart drugs of choice, and I use it regularly, although I don't use it continuously. Cholinergics are the most popular ones out there in the marketplace. If you buy a smart drug formula, um, uh, chances are it's going to have uh, DMAE, choline, uh, phosphatidylcholine, or some kind of cholinesterase inhibitor in it. And I don't generally recommend those and don't use them myself because they're not really sustainable. If you raise your acetylcholine by those methods, you get a couple of days of very much enhanced mental focus. But then after about two weeks, you're, you decline down to baseline levels again. And this is so it's not particularly sustainable. But if you're using it, Episodically, it might be very ideal. You got to cram for a study. You have a special project that's due. So it's okay to borrow from tomorrow to do it today because time is more important today than it will be tomorrow. Caffeine, um, nicotine. Um, nicotine is a pretty amazing smart drug, and it's not particularly unaffordable either. Um, you can buy nicotine gum uh, quite readily, quite easily. Um, phosphatides, um, phosphatidylserine, uh, DHA, um, found in fish oil, theanine as a relaxant for the end of the day. These are all smart drugs that, are, um, that you could consider. Then graduating to the brain. And so I've got the brain and the mind separated as categories, but on some level, um, this is, these are kind of arbitrary. Uh, this is the top end of it, what most people think about, smart drugs, cognitive performance, and memory. But the other side of it is sleep. Um, you know, sleep doesn't get much respect, but it's an absolutely essential maintenance function for the brain. If you don't sleep, 
your cognitive performance deteriorates dramatically. Sleep deprivation, this is something I learned from the um, California Toxicological Association. I did a meeting there and, and I found out that um, the impairment of driving skills for sleep deprivation and alcohol are the same. Circadian synchrony, that's, uh, I, was, I mentioned I was a night owl. Um, when I take paracetam, I become a morning person. Well-being, emotion, motivation, happiness, optimism, these are all qualities that you can affect by um, altering your mind, altering your brain. And then we have the hardware side of it, which is blooming right now, and that involves devices, um, uh, data collection and analysis, um, you know, the, the geek side of um, the designer brain. So in terms of your mind, what is it that you might look for? A lot of processing takes place in the subconscious mind. The conscious mind is like the tip of an iceberg. It's very obvious to us because it's our prefrontal cortex that we consider us. But the subconscious mind does the heavy lifting. Most of our thoughts and processing takes place in the subconscious. So um, a lot of things that people consider psychic are probably coming from that subconscious mind. So it's not very respectable to talk about psychic process, but um, I consider myself quite intuitive, and that might be another way of saying the same thing. Um, this is something that I've found a lot of value for me. Um, when I look at pictures from the Hubble telescope of the universe, I have a powerful sense of awe. Um, and thinking about creation and life and the Big Bang, um, thinking about um, living systems and thinking about how we become us um, is awe-inspiring to me. And I realized when I was playing around with smart drugs that, um, that these, these feelings, these, um, uh, this richness of life can be augmented by taking these things. So on the, uh, on the earlier diagram, I had self-assertive and self-transcendent um, experience as an arc across the top from self-transcendent being serotonin dominant and self-assertive being dopamine dominant. And that's like um, looking at uh, ego and self um, versus selflessness and, and, and uh, um, uh, a kind of um, generosity of spirit towards other people and other things. Um, and that I can, I can see that that changes when I take these different things. I'd be glad to talk about that more if, you, if anybody's interested. Um, here's a useful dynamic that I like to think about to, to, to get a kind of meta-level understanding of what we're up against here. And that is when you're looking at change and you're looking at what's going on right now and you're wondering where to go. Uh, how am I going to get from where I am to where I want to be? How can I think about this? How can I strategize it? And this is a very useful um, uh, view that helps me relate to um, choices like taking a dietary supplement or practicing meditation. The top-down part of it, that's mind, what's going on inside in your thinking. Uh, the other opposite end, bottom up, it's nutrition. The parts of our bodies. And then on top of the parts of the body is the dance of the parts of the body, the molecules, the movement, metabolism. This is uh, how we take amino acids and build proteins. This is how we convert sugar into energy. This is how we convert fat into carbohydrates into energy. Uh, and then uh, below the level of thought is, in a sense, the level I would consider the brain, which is the neuroendocrine system. This would be your, your uh, 
autonomic nervous system, your higher brain functions, your, your, your prefrontal cortex, all of those kinds of systems integrated spread down through your body to all the organs of your body, including, for example, your adrenal glands. So how do you respond to a situation? If you have a sympathetic response, signal goes down to your adrenal glands, they pump out uh, cortisol, they pump out norepinephrine, they pump out epinephrine, and you get wired. You get edgy, you get nervous, you get irritable. On the other hand, if you have the sympathetic tone going on, well, you also probably throw up because your sympathetic nervous system is the opposite of what you need to digest. But if you're calm, you eat a meal and you're calm and you're peaceful, you're having good conversation with people that you love, that promotes the uh, parasympathetic side of the nervous system and you get good digestive enzymes, you get good stomach acid production, and um, you are happy. So if you take all of the signals from the body that are coming from these um, experiences that you may have, subtle clues that you may pick up, overt symptoms, good or bad, the standard way of dealing with that in the medical profession is you suppress the symptoms with drugs. And as you might expect, that doesn't work very well. <coughs> you get perpetuation of the symptoms and those feedback into the above and underlying systems to make the problem worse. So it's a problem if you have, if you otherwise feel healthy and you're, you're, you don't know that there's a pathology going on because the symptom isn't, isn't loud enough for you to hear it. Um, you can have an underlying pathology taking place that will eventually sneak up on you. But if you do this kind of mind hacking, this kind of brain hacking, a designer brain approach, you can become aware of aspects of your metabolism that aren't really working well. Maybe you're looking at heart rate variability and you get data that you're, you're, you're having problems getting from the red, which is uh, non-harmonious heart rate variability, into the green, which is harmonious, and you go, okay, where's the underlying problem? So you look for something that based on that data that you find. Uh, the alternative, I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about here. This is a kinder and gentler technology for doing this kind of hacking because it, instead of it being a symptom that you want to suppress, it's a biofeedback signal that you want to use for optimizing something. If it's a negative thing, you want to, you want to invert it. If it's a positive thing, you want to encourage it. And that basically leads to correction of the problem. This is an example of um, how, how complex the problem can be in terms of figuring out how am I different from other people? Uh, why do I respond to something differently from somebody else? Why can't I handle bulletproof coffee gracefully? Uh, why don't I like um, uh, modafinil? Uh, why do I like um, sugar? These are all aspects of biochemical individuality, and these three dimensions that are mentioned here are what are called um, metabolic dimensions that have been described in the literature and have been used in clinical practice. And we could add body typing to that, we could add blood typing to that, we could add um, uh, you know, genetic screening of your, of your polymorphisms. Each one of these things would give you a new aspect of your individuality that you could then um, become a wiser person in terms of making decisions. So about decisions about diet, decisions about kinds of exercise that you might want to do, um, decisions about what kind of advices you want to spend your money on, and maybe even where you want to go on a vacation. So here's a list of... Uh, um, of connections between brain and mind, and or brain and body. Basically, the brain works on the same basic systems. Your brain is, in other words, just another organ of the body. Uh, it is quite unique in the sense that it burns hot. Your brain is only 3% of your body mass, but it burns 20% of your body's energy. And it doesn't really burn that amount of energy intermittently like your heart might as opposed to when you're sitting in a chair versus um, running on a treadmill, your brain basically burns hot all the time, whether you're 
thinking, trying to solve a problem, whether you're sleeping, whether you're daydreaming, your brain is basically burning way more energy than anything else. Uh, here's, a, here's a brief summary. You, you probably know most of this. Here's a brief summary of different ways of um, focusing on the question, what do you want to pay attention to? And the most common one that everybody uses is subjective attention. We all pay attention to what, what we are doing and how we're reacting to situations. Sometimes you do it better than others. Um, sometimes you may, be, uh, you may miss a lot of things, of course. Um, incremental change is very, very difficult to judge. Um, I know people who basically think they think the same thing. When, I, when I've dealt with them as clients, they think they're performing at the same level that they've always been, but when tested, they show a, a massive decrement, and it's because it crept up on them. But to get into the realm of objective assessment, um, you've, got, um, you've got to use some kind of metric. Software is pretty nice. And nowadays, we have huge amounts of software to pay attention to. Uh, online software, Quantified Mind, um, uh, Luminosity, those are great places to go because the tests are standardized, they record the data for you, all you have to do is play the games. And so you can go in and survey all that's available, play all the games, try them out. And if it's boring, cross it off your list. If it's if you do really, really well at it, cross it off your list. What you want to find is a test that's, that's kind of fun to do and that you don't do as well as you think you ought to do because that's going to give you better data. And you're not going to be able to spend you know, an hour every day doing this kind of thing. So what you want to find is, can you get good data in five minutes? Can you get good data in 15 minutes? So if you find a test that you used to be good at, that you're not good at, and that you are, uh, it's enjoyable enough that you will actually do it, that's a perfect test to choose. Um, you can always go to a neuropsychologist and get evaluated, um, pay money to a professional to do that kind of thing. Um, uh, there's a limited amount of coverage you get for that, and out-of-pocket expenses can be quite high, so chances are you might do it. If you're a fanatic, you might do it four times a year, but uh, I don't think most people would even do it twice. Uh, one of my favorite things that I talk about all the time in, in my self-care meetups is self-care testing. This is where you take it into your own life and you do it on your own. There's all kinds of really great things that you can do. I've only mentioned three here. Um, uh, proprioception testing, which is what the, the cops do when you're drunk. You know, if you're standing there with your eyes closed, can you touch your nose exactly? And how far off are you? If you make a note of how far off you are, you're getting a sense of how well your brain works and knowing where your body parts are and where they stop and start. Um, then if you take your, you know, with your eyes closed and you tilt your head back and you bend your arm in a weird position, do you still know where your nose is? So one is in your familiar mode of orientation, another one is an unfamiliar mode, so that one is a test that somebody who's compromised would have a hard time with, and the other one is trying to make somebody, make it more difficult for somebody who's good at doing that kind of thing. Um, dexterity, how many pegs can you put in a, in, a, uh, in, a, in a pegboard, that kind of thing goes to how well you're doing. And then uh, all kinds of games and memory tests and uh, uh, simple decision-making tests, complex decision-making tests. So if you see the word giraffe and a picture of a giraffe, you answer yes if the light is green and you answer no if the light is red. Uh, that's takes, how, can, how fast can you do that? It's, a, it's a, a, a good kind of test to judge how well you're doing and whether or not a change in lifestyle or a change of supplement, a change of diet, a change in the, the timing of what you're doing during the day, is that affecting you positively or negatively? The old form of Tetris got faster as the game went on, and if you made a mistake, it got more difficult. So that leads to a kind of cascade failure, which causes you to, to do well when it's below the level of your abilities, and then suddenly you fail, 
and that gives you a good endpoint that changes with your ability. Instead of it kind of tailing off where you're never really sure where it goes bad, this gives you a, a hard endpoint to judge how well you're doing. That's a very good kind of test to do. Um, some people will have something in their life, like if you're a bridge fanatic and you like to play bridge, you can join a duplicate bridge club where you're playing the same hands that other couples in the, in the room are playing. So it's not like a chess game where every game is totally different. You're actually measuring yourself in a controlled environment. Game of concentration takes a deck of cards and a stopwatch. Anybody can do that. And if you don't like how long it takes, just use black cards or just use face cards. Make the test, reduce this, the number of cards that you're doing in the test until it gets to the point where your investment of, mo of time is worth um, what you're getting out of it. Take it out and play with it. Good. Um, that's the end, and I've got eight minutes for questions. Thanks, great talk, amazing. A um, couple questions, one is, and I know this may be something we have to take out of here, but um, a friend of mine, a um, younger gentleman, was uh, doing a lot of drugs last year, he was doing LSD, and um, after the summer of doing that, he started having um, hallucinations in his waking life. Now, it doesn't happen with everyone. Um, actually, I've only heard of it happening to a couple people. Um, he's, he's still functioning, he's still you know, exercising, and he's trying to eat right and do all the things, but he can be walking down the street and he'll have to, these arguments with these voices in his head and have hallucination, so. Is he taking supplements? He's just doing superfoods right now. He doesn't really, he's not well directed in that area. Um, of course, you know, to play it safe, he's going to uh, a psychiatrist and a psychologist. And of course, they want to get him on meds right away. And he knows that that's a trap. So he's just on his healing journey. And, um, and I wanted to see what suggestions you may have. Well, the first suggestion I would have would be high dose B complex vitamins in the realm of 10 times the RDA to start with. and then if something, you saw a positive change, but it wasn't necessarily of high, high enough magnitude that you were happy with it, just briefly try 100 times the RDA. B vitamins are so non-toxic that you can run those levels up that high so to where you're trying to supersaturate all those enzymes in the brain that would be involved in neural processing. Um, that, that's been quite useful for a lot of people who've had bad trips where they would use B vitamins to bring them down and stabilize them. Um, but there's another aspect to it that um, I learned from, my, uh, from Richard Cunyon, uh, who I mentioned earlier. Um, he, had a, he's a, he calls himself a recovering psychiatrist. Um, so he's got the right mental attitude. Um, he had a, a schizophrenic client who was successfully managed for, um, I think it was two and a half decades, with megavitamins. And uh, it was working quite well uh, most of the time, but there were these periodic times when she would lose her connection to reality, and one of those times happened, and um, this woman's mother brought her in, and, and at that particular time, um, Dick was looking at coagulopathies, and the MTHFR mutations that affect about 30% of the total population and maybe, um, maybe more if your ancestors come from extreme northern climates like Norway, Finland, um, Sweden, um, northern Russia, Denmark, whatever. And so he was looking at that issue of folic acid as a potential genetic, he was considering that as a potential genetic factor for this woman's schizophrenia, and had, he had learned that there was a likelihood of that connection to coagulopathies, which is thick blood syndrome, which I suffered from when I was 40 years of age. And um, so he took some, got out some heparin and gave her a sublingual uh, dose of heparin. Normally it would be injected, but he just did it sublingually to um, 
minimize it and to slow down the process. 15 minutes later, she was calm and paying attention to the conversation. 30 minutes later, she's actively participating in the conversation. No sign of any dissociation whatsoever. So there could be something like that that's going on with this person's um, drug reaction that has to do with something that's in their diet where they're hyper-reacting to it, and that's causing their blood to thicken up that they're not it's not irrigating the brain properly, and therefore they're having schizophrenic kind of reaction or a, a, a drug, you know, what do they call it, a bad trip or flashback. I think that's the right term. Drug-induced psychosis, so they're calling it. Um, that would be a great thing to look at inflammatory markers because, as you remember, psychosis was way off on the on the actually left side of the of, in the yellow part of the diagram from dopamine dominance. And so dopamine is certainly making people edgy, compulsive, um, driven, um, dissatisfied. Um, the grass is greener on the other side of the hill. That kind of, 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 of state of being. And that could easily be, um, normally that would be described in its ex most extreme state as psychosis. And the balancing neurotransmitter is serotonin. So what would happen if you gave him a um, a glass of tryptophan dissolved in pre-digested collagen protein. This is something I talked about on the podcast with Dave, where um, you take, let's say, 100 or 200 milligrams of tryptophan, which is in normal use subtherapeutic, and you put it with a teaspoon of pre-digested collagen protein, and the peptides in the, in the protein solubilize the tryptophan, and it goes directly into the gut very, very rapidly, and then crosses the blood-brain barrier and raises serotonin in as little as 15 minutes. And I noticed that kind of effect in 15 minutes. What if is, I mix it the, in tea, it's, it's 10 minutes. What is the pre-digested collagen protein? Um, it's the it's Dave's the cells. the same it. one they have here. That's the pre-digested. It's pre the same one they have okay. here. Okay. So non-digested collagen protein, would be, we'd call that gelatin. And that is a polymer, biopolymer, that's so huge and so long that when you take a very dilute solution of it and put it in the refrigerator, it solidifies, and we call that jello. Okay. Uh, but if you snip it up into little pieces, these small protein pieces called peptides act as a solubilizing agent for the tryptophan. And normally, you know, a half a gram of tryptophan, which would be marginally therapeutic in most people in terms of producing calmness, tranquility, and maybe even might make you a little bit sleepy, um, that that would take about a gallon of water to dissolve that. Maybe three gallons of water. That's how insoluble tryptophan is. But that same 500 milligrams can dissolve in two ounces of water if you put the, the protein with it. So that would be one, one drink? Five, one drink. 500 milligrams. And if you overdose him, he falls asleep. So it's not like he's going to be juggling chainsaws or something like that. Okay. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. And what about the anandamides? And th that those are serotonin producing, so that would also be good. It, serotonin producing would be one dynamic with dopamine, and the other would be GABA. So you could try theanine on him. Can you say that again? Theanine. Theanine, okay. Well, I don't know if this is going to be fast enough, so I'll just... Yeah, theanine is, is the difference between coffee and tea is that coffee doesn't have theanine in it, and you can get jittery from it, and tea has theanine in it, and it, the calmness uh, balances out the potential jittery effects from caffeine. So you can now buy theanine in health food stores as a dietary supplement. So it's, it's thinking on a meta level that you're taking a presumed dopaminergic condition and balancing it with either GABA, which would be an alternative balancing uh, neuro, uh, neurotransmitter, or balancing it with serotonin. So you're just taking those two dimensions and investigating them with the hypothesis that his schizophrenic hallucinations uh, or psychosis is dopamine-related or is GABA deficiency or serotonin deficiency. When you, when you mess with the neurotransmitter system, you don't necessarily know um, the rel you, you don't know as much the absolute level of the neurotransmitters as you do the relative level. So raising one and lowering the other 
in a sense, produce the same kind of reactions in people. Is this something that I do when I work with people? Absolutely. I mean, this is, you know, I'm the typical geek that likes to take the clock apart and put it back together again. Only the, instead of a clock, I'm working with the human body and the human brain. So this has been a lifelong thing to learn all of the gears and wheels and stuff and how they're all organized. And I find it endless, endlessly fascinating, but you know, you know I'm weird because I actually liked organic chemistry. 